Today we start a new part of the course. So far, we've learned all about functions, how to define them, how to pass them as values to other functions, how to return them as values, and how to use functions to create functional abstractions that help control the complexity of a large program. Today, we begin talking about data. Data is representations of information inside of a computer. And most of what computer applications do is various forms of data processing. So let's begin. First of all, to learn about data, we need to learn that every value in Python has a type. And this is true of almost all programming languages. I'll start up Python. And we can see that the value of 1 is 1. And the type of that value is int which is a shorthand for integer. Now, we're talking about the, val the types of different values. So 1 plus 2 is an expression, but its value is 3. So if I ask for the type of 1 plus 2, first I'm evaluating this expression to get 3, and then asking for the type of that. Now, there are different types. So anything with a decimal representation is a class float, which is a different type than int. And the nice thing about ints is that they can represent exactly arbitrarily large values. On the other hand, it's not always the case that a float will be an exact representation. So I might write 0.33222. So I might write 0 0.3 with many different decimal places is equal to 0 0.3. And way out here, I'll change something to a 7, it will still say that's true, because these are beyond the finite representation of a floating type. What other types of there? Well, there's a complex type, which represents complex numbers, true and false are of the bool type, which stands for boolean. We met George Boole earlier in the course. And when you combine ex different types in an expression, Python tries to give you a type back that represents the value of that expression. So we can combine two different types, and from them we will get a float. Or we can combine two different Boolean values, and we'll get an int. What happened there? Well, it turns out that long ago someone decided true plus true should be two in Python, and now it's too late to correct that mistake. What we've seen so far are called native data types. They're built into the Python language. So the properties of native data types are that there are primitive expressions, such as the numerals that we typed in, or the word true with a capital case T, that evaluate to values of these types. So those primitive expressions are also built into the language. And there are also built-in functions, operators, and methods that manipulate those values. So it's predetermined what happens when you add together an integer and a floating point number, an int and a float. So the numeric types that we saw so far are int and float and complex. And one thing you should know about ints is that they represent integers exactly, whereas floats represent real numbers, but they do so with finite approximations. Now, you saw in that demo that every time I took the type of something, it was printed out as class int, or class float. What you're seeing there is an aspect of the object system in Python. So what's an object? Well, objects are used to represent information. And they consist of both data, the information itself, and some behavior associated with that data that are bundled together to create an abstraction. So objects can represent things, such as numbers, but also properties or interactions or processes, or anything that you can imagine representing in a computer. And the type of an object is called a class. Classes are actually first class values in Python, meaning they can be passed around and manipulated as well. So what we're introducing here is an approach to programming called object-oriented programming which is a metaphor for organizing large programs. 
It's called a programming paradigm because it's a unifying way of thinking about lots of large programs and how they interact. So we'll understand this metaphor and we'll also learn the specialized syntax in the Python language, which improves the composition of programs by making them easier to understand by other people. In Python, every value is an object. That means every value has some attributes, and a lot of data manipulation will happen through object methods, which we'll see in a minute. Now the difference to separate in your mind between functions and objects is that functions are designed to do one thing, and a functional abstraction has a particular behavior, whereas objects tend to do many related things all related to a particular type of value. Let's look at a demonstration. So what we're going to do is look at an object type called date. This is part of the Python standard library and it's a type of compound object. So I can set today to be a date in 2013, September 25th. And I can set another day, your freedom date, to be 2013, 12, 20, the day of the final exam in this course. Now today and freedom both represent different dates. Objects are useful in that they represent information. They also behave as you would expect that type of information to behave. So for instance, if I take the difference between the date of your freedom and today, I get a reasonable representation of how long it will be until you take your final exam 86 days from now. What else can a date do? Well, today has a year. I use dot notation in order to retrieve a particular attribute of the object bound to the name today. Today also has a day, and today has something called a method, which is a function that defines behavior for the particular object. So today, if I invoke the method called stirftime, which is kind of a classic name for string formatted time, and then I pass in a way of formatting that day into a string, then it renders Wednesday, September 25 as today. Now at no point did I announce that today was Wednesday. Instead, it's just part of what it means to be a date to know what day of the week you are in addition to the month and the year and the day. So we see that this date representation that we're using, which has this class date, is in fact not just a representation of the information, but also contains some behavior that lets it behave like a date. And that makes it a useful abstraction for dates. 